Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Legal Nurse Podcast, and I have with me today Diane Tomicelli, who is a lead clinical consultant. She's a nurse who works for a consulting firm hired by facilities to help with their software integration, implementation, improvement in their clinical settings. Diane and I talked um, quite some time ago about having her on the show, and this is the fruition of that conversation that we had. One interesting thing that you might not know about Diane is that she met her husband on the way to the bathroom. And she was in the military. Why don't you share that story, Diane, about how your husband protected you? I think that's fascinating. Um, we were in Desert Storm and the bathrooms had to, we had to dig the bathrooms out of the sand so far away from the hospital and so far away from the tents where we would sleep. And it was not safe at night to go uh, out to the bathrooms alone because they were too close to what we called the berm, which was the wall that would block you from the rest of the desert. Uh, and Bedouins and other people would come over that wall. So I would have to go next door uh, to the tent next door and they called themselves the dune coons and uh, kind of knock on the door and ask one of them to escort me to the bathroom. And so did the rest of the nurses. And so, uh, yeah, I met my husband in the, with 410th evac hospital over there. So you just never know if you are single and listening to this podcast, you could meet your husband in this or, or wife in an unusual circumstances. <laughs> And then they end up protecting you for the rest of your life. Look at that. So Absolutely. As, <laughs> you've been working now in this area of electronic medical records and probably um, have encountered or talked to individuals who have some misperceptions about electronic medical records and probably some strong reactions, both pro and con. Let's start with the misperceptions. What are some of the things that you run into? So I think some of the biggest misconceptions that people think is that all electronic documentation is created equal because it's not. From one software system to another, it can be very, very different. And what you might need to ask for could be different because each software system has hard-coded labels and names for things that doesn't necessarily coincide with us clinically minded folks and what we've traditionally called it on paper. So that is one of the bigger misconceptions. Um, another one is that, that you can take something that's been created on paper and just kind of plop it in and it exists now electronically um, because it doesn't work that way. So even though you may have worked something out on paper, when you put it in the system to work within the functionality of the software system that you're building or that you're bringing up, it doesn't exactly look the same. And you can kind of equate that to, you know, functionality you use every day on your cell phone or your email, how you can customize that. But you may have it worked out on paper exactly what it looks like, but then when you put it in your phone, it displays in a different manner. And if you want to print it out, it even prints out in yet another display. So those are uh, some strong misconceptions. And sometimes people feel like they have asked for what they're looking for when in all actuality, the terminology is very different. And I think that's the strongest piece right there is learning the terminology for that particular software that's used. Have you encountered people who do have strong reactions to electronic medical records? I have as in, if you mean an end user or somebody that's mm -hmm. utilizing the electronic records, I've encountered patients that um, they, they don't feel that you're paying attention to them because you keep looking at the screen to type things in. I've encountered physicians that get very upset because uh, they can't focus on what they're doing with the patient. They had to focus on getting that order into the computer correctly. So they've hired scribes to do a lot of their uh, work on that. And of course, nursing staff and other clinical staff can have a very strong reaction because it's very difficult to tell the story of what was going on with the patient. Not always, but sometimes 
depending on the software that you have and the way it was designed and built by that particular facility. So it's all kind of just de depends on the way it was presented, the way it was rolled out, the, who was making the decisions, were they making informed decisions? Was it a clinically minded person making those decisions? So sometimes there can be a very strong reactions of frustration. And then others in, you know, much younger than I, that grew up with, you know, on computers, they tend to not necessarily have as many uh, frustrations because they understand it. And that's what they've been working with their entire lives. Makes me think of my older son who got his first computer when he was six and just assumed that there would be computers in his life. And yet my husband and I got our first computers in 1986, we bought our first computer for our home. Um, we were obviously not six at the time. <laughs> I remember my husband read the documentation that came with a computer and it said, if more than one person in your household is going to be using a computer, you should consider buying a second one. And he said, yeah, Pat, they just want to sell us another machine. You know, like two months later, he said, I think we ought to get another machine, Pat. I think it's not possible for us to share this. Yeah, I was actually, I had graduated from nursing school and was working as a registered nurse before I ever had anything to do with a computer. Everything up to that point had all been paper or some, you know, I might look up uh, through the fish machine at the library, things like that, but really to do any computer work. And that was simply order entry at the uh, facility I went to work with at that time. Whereas then my sister was having children and while they are babies, there are overlays you put on the keyboard that they sit there and they pound. They don't even have good coordination yet, but they learn that what they're touching on the keyboard does something else on the screen. Mm. And, you know, so, and today little babies are flipping through cell phones and looking at pieces of data. So mm -hmm. very different world than what I grew up in. Yes. And for legal nurse consultants who have been used to interpreting handwriting and dealing with printing out medical records. The question then comes up when you have an electronic medical record, should you be printing out those records for maximum ease and analysis, or should you be looking at it through a software program? What are your thoughts about that? I think actually, in my opinion, the optimal way to view that medical record would be to go to the facility and sit with the clinical analyst and view it in the way that the doctor and the nurse is allowed to view it. That, however, is not really the way things are done. So the other way is you can um, print it out or work with it within a software uh, system such as Adobe, the, the printed version. Uh, just knowing that the printed version does not look exactly like what was presented to the provider or to the nurse, to the physical therapist or respiratory therapist, the printed version always looks a little bit different. And data, it doesn't really tell a good story. Data pieces are here and there and everywhere. Uh, and sometimes you may feel that you have, that you're missing some data only to find out that the data you feel you're missing is really listed in a different section on that printed version of the chart. I have had the experience of working with medical records that were generated electronically and then the flow sheets that the nurses complete go on for pages and pages and pages. I'm working on a record right now in which the physician daily notes occupy eight, nine, 10 pages and 90% of it is copied over from the day before, or maybe updated with the newest labs, or it's a running list of all of the diagnostic tests that were done for a specific issue. Um, I hear attorneys complain when they're interpreting medical records that have come from an electronic system that there's tons of data, but very little information. Is there any way around that, do you know? So the more specific of, of what you're looking for, the more specific you are, the better off you're going to be in the long run. So because like you just said, 
there's times when you can ask you to print off the record and it was a three day stay or less at a facility in an inpatient. You may end up with 1500 pages of data. And again, like he, the lawyer said, may not have a lot of the information that you need, but a very significant high number of pages. So most of the software systems out there have reports that can be run, but you would have to know what reports those are. So in your interrogatories, it could be what reports do you use to transfer a patient or what reports do you use uh, to send information to the state or to the federal government? And sometimes when you find out those reports, you can uh, then request one of those reports for a certain date and it'll tell the story a little bit better. So when you're getting a printout of the record, there a lot of times it's what is chosen by the legal department of that facility to say, this is what we consider our legal medical record. So everybody designs a piece, okay, I want to take these nurses notes and I want all these nurses notes, no matter when they're documented on, all to go into that legal chart so they don't miss anything but they're not then defined out in a manner that makes it easy to read. However, some places have defined reports that you can run that display the data in a different manner. That's not always the case, but sometimes it's the case. And so it never hurts to go ahead and ask, is there a different version or do you have a report that uh, you send to the doctor that they're, they're referring to? What was the report you sent to them? please print that report out and send it to me. Because you may get the same exact data that was printed out and sent to you in a chart, but it is displayed in a different manner. So sometimes that is a better way to ask for some additional information. Mm -hmm. When we first started transitioning to electronic medical records, we saw a combination of handwritten and electronic medical records combined into one chart. It also seemed like in the beginning of this that there were specific programs that didn't talk to other programs, like the lab program didn't talk to the order program or the order program didn't talk to the L&D software. I've heard the term hybrid can you define for our listener, what does that mean? And are the systems in use now, are they talking to each other so that the labor and delivery nurses can look at the lab results and, and there aren't separate silos in terms of software? So the hi hybrid chart simply means that there is more than one form or format of data, it's not all in one software system. And it could be a hybrid chart, meaning there are pieces that remain on paper, such as code blue charting. A lot of times that remains on paper due to the difficulty. Other places will incorporate it within their electronic documentation. But then it gets scanned into the record. So there will be pieces that are handwritten, but it is scanned into the record to be in one place. However, there's also hybrid chart when they're referring to the fact of we have multiple different software systems that talk to the main software system. And when I say it talks to it, meaning it's connected in some way, it doesn't mean all the data transfers because there are times when specifically, you know, OBGYN has a lot of their own software just because it's very specialized could be anesthesia, some maybe uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, different systems and uh, several pharmacy systems as well may store more data in their system than what is stored in the main system. So it's a hybrid chart. They may print out pieces from another system and scan them into the record, or it may be that you have to ask for uh, all the different vendors that you have to look at to see where all the data is. And one prime example, um, and I've heard other legal nurse consultants talk about this as well. When you're dealing with medications, um, 
There's multiple systems involved in medications, even if the software system you have handles medications well and gives you an electronic medication administration record, there are uh, other software systems. If you have a dispensing machine, such as Pixis or Omnicell, those dispensing machines store data in their databases as well. So I know on a case I was on at one time, um, there was a big question about how much morphine was actually given to the patient and what was um, wasted. And so I asked for the uh, audit trail for the Pixis machine. And that's how we proved that the amount of uh, morphine that was wasted was very minimal and not, it didn't match. The records did not match as to what was actually given to the patient. So a lot of data can be stored in other systems and that would also be a hybrid chart. And so um, there's also some doctor's offices may have what they use in their office and they say, oh yeah, it connects to the main system in the hospital. Well, that connection may only be for the patient's name, date of birth, and maybe they, their allergies. Still other systems may connect and have name, date of birth, allergies, and their current medications. Some of them will add in the problem list for the history of their problems, such as you know an HIE, the health information exchange. So some of your data, it may also be shared and stored in an HIE. So it depends on what you're working at and what the case involves. If it involves a lot of data passing back and forth, you may want to ask, well, what HIE does this facility look at? What data was passed through the portal to go there? So almost all records these days are somewhat hybrid because there are so many different systems out there to talk to. There's not one system that handles all of it. And so they are connected or in our terms, they call it interfaced together. And so you just kind of have to start looking at, okay, well, what, is, what systems are they interfaced to and what data is captured and saved in those other systems? And then through the discovery process, the legal nurse consultants would help the attorney with the language. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, they would help them through the language because a legal nurse consultant would know about a Pixis machine or an Omnicell machine where a, an attorney may not. A legal nurse consultant may notice though as they're reviewing the record that this looks like a lab report and it doesn't really look the same as what a normal lab report would look like. And the solicitor find out, oh, that's because it's interfaced and we're only getting the report back. Maybe that report's coming in from uh, a different system because uh, some things with radiology is the same way. So um, a legal nurse consultant would know that some of those other systems store that data as well. If you have it in the main system and it's printed there, you may want to keep it that, you know, you're looking at that. But if there's questions about you're worried about the uh, consistency or is this a, the actual true result that was given at that time? And then look into the other systems that interfaced in because a nurse would know to look. They know that it's not the main system where lab values are run. They, there may be six different machines that are connected to flow the, the results back in. <laughs> a lot um, of information. And yeah. actually, it, it gets quite complicated. <laughs> oh, I can see that. And I'm thinking also there could be tests that are sent to outside labs, which is a pretty common occurrence because Absolutely. it's a level of sophistication or a rare type of test. So they send the specimen somewhere else and then get the results in. Yes. And uh, the way that data comes back in depends on the facility. Do they choose when they receive that data back? Is it manually entered by someone in lab into the main system or does it automatically flow into the lab? Most of the time in today's world, it automatically flows back in. Mm -hmm. Are there instances where it's confusing or difficult to interpret data? I think it is if someone is of the mindset that they're used to looking at all the data flowing in a certain manner. 
So if a person is used to looking at all of the provider notes and reading through all the physician notes and then looking at all the nurses notes and reading through all of that, it can sometimes be confusing because pieces are not in the same order. Um, there may be different modules or different sections of the chart that are used to document data. For example, if a patient goes to surgery, they may be using AIMS or another system that has that documentation and that documentation never goes back into the record completely. They just send a report of the documentation that goes into the main system. But to get to the full documentation, you would have to ask for the piece from uh, the other software. So I think it does get confusing uh, for attorneys. I, I honestly don't know how they review medical records that are electronically printed out without having a legal nurse consultant there to work with them and help them work their way through those records. What about a, a monitoring system that's available in the OR? Would that type of data work its way into the medical record or would the anesthesia record be the only way to determine what the patient's vital signs were at a specific time? It really depends on the particular software system. So, and how much uh, work was done to integrate that together. A lot of software systems can only take in numerical data for some pieces. Others can integrate back and forth entire sentences or entire pieces of data to flow back and forth. But you are correct a lot of times from anesthesia, if you wanna see what was on the monitor, you do have to go to that anesthesia record. Now the monitors that may be used in intensive care unit or uh, on a telemetry unit, you can pull that data into your system depending on the type of interface that you have. And a lot of times nursing has the ability when they pull it in to delete pieces. And that makes complete sense because maybe the patient was laying on the arm that the blood pressure cuff was on when the machine took their blood pressure. And it was a weird reading that's not an accurate reading of their blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So the nurse, as they pull that data in from the other systems, would delete that off and it would not show on the the medical record, and that would be uh, an accurate thing to do. So it there are times vital signs are not necessarily, the data is not there. Now, even our um, blood glucose monitor machines, a lot of times when you dock them back into the whatever docking uh, station that they have, depending on the way the software system is set up, that information from the glucose monitor machine would flow right back into the patient's chart. Not mm -hmm. always, but in some cases. I know that there is often concern about whether the data is correct that is displayed in copies of the medical record, or is there a backstory behind that data? Did somebody go in and change it, review it, uh, do something to try to conceal a sequence of events? There's often suspicions when there's a catastrophic event, and then the attorney will request an audit trail. Can you tell our listener who's watching this on um, our YouTube channel, Legal Nurse Business, or listening to it, can you tell that listener or watcher, what do we need to know about the concept of an audit trail when we're helping attorneys? I think the, the biggest thing to do is be very specific in what you're looking for, because audit trails are very good tools to find out if somebody went back in and documented something at a later date, um, more so than on paper, because every keystroke is monitored by the computer itself. Now, you may not be able to pull out every keystroke in an audit trail, depending on the type of audit trails that particular software system developed. Um, However, you don't want to just say in, in your request for production, send me an audit trail. You want to be very, very specific to the point where you say, I want to see the audit trails of all orders placed from this date to this date. Or I want to see the audit trail of all nursing documentation, nutrition service documentation, case management documentation, physical therapy, occupational therapy from this date to this date. 
Um, and the reason being is you can literally, if you just request, send me the audit trail of all nursing documentation, you could end up with five or 600 pages minimum. And really you only need five or six of those pages, but because you did all that, you, you kind of, it takes you forever to get through that information to find what you're looking for. So for an audit trail, you need to be as specific as possible. You don't want to tip your hand, you know, exactly as to what you're looking for, but at the same time, um, be specific. Mm -hmm. And is it possible by looking at that information that you can determine if somebody went into the record after the fact or documented events well after they occurred? So there, that's actually, believe it or not, the statement you just made is two different audit trails. So one is an audit trail of who entered that chart. So you can do an audit trail of tell me everybody that entered this patient's chart and where they went in that chart when they entered the chart. The other piece is I want to look at this specific data because I wanna see the history of when they documented for this patient. So this doctor um, backdated an order or this nurse backdated a bunch of documentation because the presentation that a lot of the software systems do, which is rightfully so and actually good, is that even though you might backdate or back time some documentation, when you're reviewing it in a live system, it shows it in the correct order. So you're not having to flip around and, and find data, but it shows it in the correct order. But in the background, in the history of that, it'll show that this particular user on this particular device went in and documented on this assessment or this intervention or whatever piece, and they changed the date and time to be this other date and time. So it does tell you that. Mm -hmm. What types of cases, Diane, could you assist attorneys or legal nurse consultants in analyzing? What would be the area of expertise that you can offer people? Well, in all honesty, any cases that review that require review of electronic medical records or even paper medical records. Um, so it depends on if you're looking for an expert witness, I cannot be an expert witness for bedside nursing or anything like that at this particular time because I've been away from that for too long. But if you're just looking for some assistance in reviewing any medical records, I can help in all those instances. My area of expertise is in electronic records. However, those electronic records sometimes contain a lot of scanned in papers. Um, so pretty much anything, uh, I do, I, I really am passionate about the way electronic software systems present data, the way that data is being able to be used by the clinicians. Um, I am very well known in my area for being able to go in and optimize the way something will present to a physician or a nurse so they can make better clinical decisions. And some of the teams that I work with at the different facilities uh, always comment on why do you make us look at it in this other way? We're just interested in how we're going to input it. And I say, well, if you're the nurse coming on or you're the physician coming on and you really need to read that data, you need to see how the way you designed it looks in a report and how it looks in a live medical record. So I am very passionate about anything that comes out uh, with electronic records. And then certainly if there's cases out there where they're trying to determine um, what software systems were involved and is there data stored in another software system that we could get our hands on to look at and compare it to the chart. All right. Well, how can our listener find out how to connect with you? What would be the best way to do that? I have a website. It's called legalitrn.com, as in L E G. A L I T R N dot com. And that's my website. You can also find me at Nerd Tomicelli's Nurse Consulting on Facebook. And um, I'm also on Twitter at uh, Legal ITRN1. So multiple ways to find me. And my uh, email address would be Legal ITRN at gmail.com. Perfect. Well, thank you, Diane. You've given us some tips, some concrete suggestions, 
taken us into the world of pixels and some of the nuances associated with electronic medical records. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge with our audience. Thank you very much for having me today. This has been very enjoyable. And thank you to you who's been listening to Diane and I chat about electronic medical records. This is the way of documentation now and in the future. And it requires some specific skills and knowledge in order to be able to interpret what turns into reams of information and sometimes not um, a clear answer to the questions that we are looking for as legal nurse consultants meaning we've got to do some digging in order to pull that information out. Be sure to come back next week. We'll have a new guest, a new interview, and share a review on uh, Apple Podcast. Also, go to podcast.legalnursebusiness.com. We have some new bundles of our best shows, meaning the most popular shows, on specific topics that you can access by giving us a name and an email address, and you'll be able to download that information. Thanks. Take care. Would you like the best of the best legal nurse consulting podcasts? Before I explain how you can get them, here's a tiny bit of background. I'm Pat Iyer. I started Legal Nurse Podcast in September 2016 to bring you tips, inspiration, and new ideas in a new format. I've written a lot of books and I've taught a lot of courses, but I didn't have a way to reach you through audio. Since 2016, the podcast grew to include guest interviews, a co-host, transcripts, and the video format. When I started the podcast, what I did not expect was the extent of our international audience. My podcast hosting company keeps track of the location of our listeners and the number of downloads. You are part of an international audience. We have listeners in 82 countries. Our top six countries are the U.S., Japan, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the U.K. Our podcasts have been downloaded over 102,000 times. And I know which shows are downloaded the most. That brings me to what I want to announce today. Now available is our newest podcast bundle of top shows. Using the data from our hosting company, I created bundles of top podcasts in six categories. Marketing, client relationships, finance, business development, expertise, and stories of successful LNCs. These bundles are found only on my website at podcast.legalnursebusiness.com. Each bundle has the top four shows in that category. When you go to podcast.legalnursebusiness.com, you'll be able to put in your name and your email address and pick the category of bundle that you are interested in listening to. You'll pick that topic and you'll listen to the four shows in that bundle. You can pick one or more of the topics. You'll also be able to get the deluxe workbook, which has questions to deepen your knowledge and to help you focus on the key points in each of our shows. The workbook also has the full transcripts to enable you to refer to the knowledge we shared without having to re-listen to the show. There's a small investment for the workbook. Thank you for listening to Legal Nurse Podcast and watching it on our YouTube channel at Legal Nurse Business. Your interest keeps my podcast going and growing. And be sure to go to podcast.legalnursebusiness.com to pick your podcast bundles and workbooks to enhance your knowledge. Hi, this is Pat Iyer with Jamie Gary. We have just been talking about mediation, a term that you encounter as a legal nurse consultant you've heard about. Jamie has a unique role as both a mediator and a legal nurse consultant who can provide support to attorneys who are managing their case resolutions through mediation. 
Jamie, what are the highlights of some of the topics that we covered in your podcast? Oh, Pat, the highlights that uh, we cover in this uh, podcast are about what mediation is and how that differs from arbitration, the role of the legal nurse, um, both as a mediator and as a support person for an attorney in the mediation process. Uh, We talked a little bit uh, about um, examples of how the skill set, my skill set in particularly, uh, can impact a mediation uh, and bring that to a positive resolution. And Jamie shared a story of a man who came into a mediation profoundly angry and what she did to calm him down and achieve a successful resolution with a man who had a huge chip on his shoulder. She'll share with you in this podcast what she discovered about this man using her nursing skills and why that had a big impact on the mediation. You'll be sure to want to come to Jamie Gary's podcast on mediation and the role of the LNC with mediation. Be sure to return to Legal Nurse Podcast and check Jamie Gary's podcast. Thanks so much.